and it was a penalty and there's three minutes left. I started thinking to myself like, oh my gosh, I don't want to let anybody down. And I was like, wait a second, no, I've got this. I've been practicing this. In college, I didn't really have much of a social life because I'm not sacrificing any second of the sleep that I need. I was told I was too small, not athletic enough, not fast enough. Don't let one, one person's thing that they say to you define you. Instead, let it develop you. Welcome to the Winners Club podcast. I'm your host, Bryce Wilson. And today I'm here with pro soccer player, Courtney Sabasco. Courtney, thanks for being here. Thank you. Thank you for having me. So we're going to get into your mindset and what it's like being a D1 and pro athlete. Uh, before we do, I'd like to hear about your journey to become a pro athlete. So who are you as an athlete growing up? I grew up playing for Solar Soccer Club. I started playing there when I was eight and went, played all the way through there until I was 18. Be loyal. <laughs> yes. And then uh, I committed to SMU as a sophomore in high school. I kind of always knew where I wanted to go because of the coaching staff at SMU. Mm -hmm. At the time was Chris Petroselli, who's now the head coach of the Chicago Red Stars. So I knew that would be the best option really for me to go continue my development. In high school, that was club. In high school, you were the district MVP. So of course, you know, it's not the same level as club, but what do you think led to you becoming an MVP and also um, playing well at a high club? I think playing at that type of a level definitely came with some sacrifice. Mm -hmm. right. So kind of growing up, I think a lot of people, when you're a teenager, you're really concerned about like your social life right. and uh, where you fit in and social groups and stuff like that. But I was always very much into like soccer and not mm -hmm. willing to sacrifice anything that right. was going to interfere with soccer. Mm -hmm. So yeah, soccer came first for me mm -hmm. and I was willing to do whatever it took to, you know, keep developing. Mm -hmm. And I think I've always kind of had a serious mindset, even at a young age. Mm -hmm. So I think that's what really set me up for all of those things. Can you think of like a sacrifice that a time that you had to sacrifice, whether in high school and college, where you know other friends are going to party or, or going out, and then you were saying, "No, I have to go train." In high school, I definitely had to miss, you know, homecoming or mm -hmm. high school football games because I was traveling on the oh, weekends yeah, right. with my teammates who were going to compete. Mm -hmm. So, like those types of things that a lot of people love to go do, but it never really bothered me. <laughs> yeah. I didn't mind. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So homecoming is not that big of a deal. <laughs> no, but to some people, it right. really is. Mm -hmm. Or you know, having really early curfews with mm -hmm. things. Mm -hmm. College. I didn't really have much of a social life mm -hmm. because during right. season, like I said, I'm not sacrificing any second of the sleep that I need to yeah. perform. And I, like right. sleep is really important. Right. So I wasn't willing to sacrifice anything that's going to set me up to do the best that I can. That's important. Sleep is definitely yeah. uh, under underrated. And then uh, going to SME, you committed early as a sophomore. Why did you want to go to them that early on? I had done some, uh, it was, I don't know, remember what they're called exactly, like national team training centers, mm -hmm. the best training pool mm -hmm. of DFW would come to these training centers mm -hmm. with the youth national national teams. Mm -hmm. They were hosted by SMU. Mm -hmm. So Chris Petroselli, the head coach at the time, was one of my coaches. What did you learn from that environment? Where it's high intensity? What did you learn from that? I was smaller than everybody <laughs> else. Mm -hmm. And when I would go to those things, I was like, man, like, I have a lot of work to right. do. <laughs> it's good to be, get that wake-up call early because I had kind of the opposite. I In high school, I was thought I was good. And then I got to college and I had a big wake-up call. Like, oh, I'm not. There's many thousands of players out there that are better. <laughs> but for you, when it came to SMU, uh, you had, you started games, you got goals, like you played really well your first year. So what do you think led to you playing really well at your first year? I guess probably having no expectations for myself. Mm -hmm. My first year I came in, I didn't have any expectations other than just to do my best. Mm -hmm. And it was kind of freeing. Mm -hmm. But I definitely think that just coming in with that mindset helped me kind of step up and help mm -hmm. the team in whatever way that I could. Mm -hmm. Did you have any difficulty transitioning like that first couple of weeks or months? Yes, I would say I did. Obviously, college, when you step up from club to college, it's faster. Right. Definitely leaving that freshman year, there was a lot of things I knew I needed to work on, like mm -hmm. defending right. and learning how to be a more of a complete player mm -hmm. and then heading the ball. <laughs> yeah, so yeah, was, those are two yeah. things that I was like, yeah, I got to work on this. <laughs> you score any headers in your, in your career? I actually did last nice. year. Nice. And it was probably my favorite goal <laughs> <Really>? ever <laughs> I've ever scored. <laughs> Is that like your first header, I guess, in college? Not really, you won't count high school? Yeah, okay. it, really first header that's like super memorable. Right. Right. Uh, especially because, you know, my college coaches at the time were like, you don't have the ball. <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, I know. So yeah. it was like, <laughs> show you. Show you. like right. so it was, it was a fun moment mm -hmm. and a moment for me to kind of show that, you know, mm -hmm. when you start working on things, it takes courage to right. head the ball yeah. and got to put yourself in there yeah. no matter how big or small you are. Right. So uh, But it pays off. And so 
I think yeah, the first two years you played well, and then that junior year was that the year you got your injury, or that when COVID happened. So I hit a low point kind of before COVID. Mm. My role changed. Okay. Uh, I've been you know dominantly an attacking mid, mm -hmm. and based on what the team needed, my role changed to be more of a box to box midfielder, mm. which was kind of out of my comfort zone. Mm -hmm. And I had a hard time kind of embracing that mm -hmm. because I felt as if, you know, I wasn't very good at it yeah. and there was a lot to learn with it. So I mm -hmm. felt a little bit discouraged mm -hmm. uh, during that season and I hadn't really had any assists, which mm -hmm. is like my favorite statistic, yeah. you know, <laughs> okay, and that's yeah. how I feel like I'm contributing the most. Mm -hmm. And I didn't have a goal the whole season, so yeah. I didn't even really get on the stat sheet. But that was unusual for me. Mm -hmm. It's I was impacting the, the game in a way that I wasn't used to. Mm -hmm. And so that was an adjustment. It made me question a lot about mm -hmm. myself as a player. Yeah. Looking back on it, it was kind of the start of me becoming a complete midfielder and yeah. being able to do it all. Yeah. Uh, so, so it started then, I think, is when I hit a low point. And then that's what I left off on was that season. Mm, yeah. And then uh, at the end of that season, that's when I realized I needed ankle reconstruction surgery. Mm -hmm. And then COVID happened where we had that year where mm -hmm. we were like one of the only teams in the country that didn't play a season. Oh. We didn't have enough people. We had seniors opting out. Uh, so it left us with like a pool of like 15 players. Mm -hmm. So we didn't end up playing and that was super difficult because, you know, each week you're thinking you're going to play and then people are testing positive mm -hmm. and going through that, you know, for a year straight definitely was really hard, especially when I came off a season mm -hmm. that I really didn't feel fulfilled. Mm -hmm. I was just dying to play right. and it just took two years really mm -hmm. to get back to where mm -hmm. we could play. And within that COVID period, I did have more uh, surgeries to go through yeah. to where I was in a wheelchair. Yeah. And <laughs> so it was like, as much adversity as somebody could mm -hmm. go through it for sports in, in one period, plus COVID, I went through and it mm -hmm. definitely built a lot of things mm -hmm. for me. Was there a lowest moment? You talked about having a two boots and you walked on with that or before that uh, when you weren't you know, on the stat sheet. Yeah. Uh, so was there a lowest moment where it was like, I don't know if I can keep doing this? No, <laughs> there was no. It was always how can I respond? Mm -hmm. I think for me that I was mm -hmm. just like I was ready to respond. Mm -hmm. And then going through all those surgeries, I remember my mindset shifting from I'm just going to be grateful for whatever opportunity I get to play, mm. no matter what it is. And mm. even on the bad days where I have a bad training or I have a bad game or bad match or bad pass, I'm mm. just grateful that I can even play. Mm. That's a yeah. great perspective to have. And then it paid off because when you came back senior year, you won midfielder of the year and you were made to the Herman Trophy list. So what kind of mentality did you come back with? Would you learn from that whole journey to help you get up, to get to that level? My whole life, I've been a perfectionist. Mm -hmm. Like, I think I'm my toughest critic internally. Mm -hmm. I knew coming back, okay, I got physically healed and everything. And mentally, you know, COVID was what it was. Mm -hmm. But I, was, I still have some work to do. Mm -hmm. And that was really just with my mentality of, mm -hmm. of not getting so fixated on mm -hmm. every single little thing. Mm -hmm. Stop overthinking and just start playing, showing up, enjoying it and having fun. Mm -hmm. Because I found that. I play my best and unlock new potential mm -hmm. when I'm enjoying myself and having fun. It seems like you have a great mindset and I want to learn, like, how did you learn that mindset? I know you, you did study sports ecology undergrad. Uh, so was that, what's something in maybe class that you learned or like, what, how did you learn that mindset? Taking sports psychology, you know, I was told my sophomore year, the reason I wasn't scoring is because I was in a sophomore slump. Mm -hmm. And I had a professor here that was like, oh, I hate that term. Mm -hmm. And he works, he's a sports psychologist for the Mavericks. Mm -hmm. He's like, I hate that term. It's called just sports. Right. Some days sports go for you. Some days they go against you. And that's just how it is. You're not mm -hmm. going to, you might not play your best every single game, mm -hmm. but you got to move on and you have to let it go. Mm -hmm. And him bringing that awareness to me of like, okay, I'm not in a sophomore slump, but me thinking that I saw how powerful me thinking that mm -hmm. was to yeah. my performance. Mm -hmm. That was really the start of my interest uh, because my interest in sports psychology and uh, you know, helping people develop their leadership skills, all those things come from my own experiences mm -hmm. and what I've been through. Are there any mental practices you do uh, to work on your mindset? Definitely. Some have to do with soccer and some don't. Mm -hmm. I do a lot of journaling mm -hmm. and those types of activities mm -hmm. and reading. Mm -hmm. But if they all have to do with soccer, I found that it was almost too much. Mm -hmm. And something that I think a lot of athletes struggle with is, you know, finding their worth and their identity outside of sport. Right. And that COVID period was a great time for me to really find myself outside of my sport, which I think really helped me. I'm super religious and spiritual. Mm -hmm. So Bible studies, right. those are the things that I find that refresh me mm -hmm. and keep me able to perform or be present. Mm -hmm. Self-talk right. is That's a thing right. I've learned That's a lot right. about. And I guess becoming more aware with my self-talk. Mm -hmm. So when I hear a perspective that's maybe too negative or too harsh, I'm always rewriting mm -hmm. perspectives mm -hmm. to use them to respond. Mm -hmm. Self-talk was a big thing that you know helped me as an athlete. I didn't realize 
the things I said to myself until I heard about what self-talk was and I realized how bad I was speaking to myself. So was that a time, did you have negative self-talk in high school or in college? Is that, where was the time when you kind of worked on that? Within the past two years, I'll mm -hmm. say. My teams that I play for or any team that I get the privilege to be a part of are everything to me. Mm -hmm. So I'm so invested in the team and the team's success. But at the same time, I'm always super hard on myself. Mm -hmm. And I guess I just want, I've always wanted to just do enough for my teammates mm -hmm. and make sure I'm doing my best for my teammates. Mm -hmm. And that's always what I've like measured myself on. But, you know, there've been times where we've won maybe a close game or, you know, it doesn't matter mm -hmm. if it's a game that's like 2-1 or 4-0, I'm still holding myself to those same, saying, or we lose, holding myself to the same rigorous standards of I could have done more. Mm -hmm. And here's what I, I, like, I'll be holding on to this one shot that mm -hmm. I missed that if I would have done this, it would have made it easier maybe on somebody else. Mm -hmm. Or if I missed this tackle or this opportunity, those things would stick with me mm. for way too long. Mm. And uh, so the past two years, I really, I think my most polished year with my mentality was mm -hmm. this past uh, super senior year. It's good to evaluate yourself after a game and see what you could have done better. Uh, you said that it was a negative aspect if you took it too long. So how do you turn that into a positive where you can, after a game, you say, hey, I should have done this better. But then by the next game, you're not thinking about that. Yeah, no, it takes me back to an instance where my sophomore year, we were asked to go back and watch a game because it was so bad and to send five things that we could have done better. And I think I sent a list of 80 things <laughs> with the timestamps wow. of, <laughs> of oh, okay. uh, I think I still have the document today of, <laughs> of what I could have done better. Mm -hmm. I think I had that first step as a player, like, mm -hmm you know, you identify it. Like mm -hmm. that's the first step, right? right? But then it's it takes action to just mm -hmm. rechange it. Right. So kind of being committed to letting it go right. and putting it into action instead of it sitting in your thoughts. Even mm -hmm. if you do one thing better than the last time, then you're gracious to yourself and you celebrate mm -hmm. that with yourself. So I guess it's just celebrating the small successes mm -hmm. yeah. will help you evolve and grow and and keep, you know, keep going in, in a positive direction. Yeah. Do you have a failure practice? So maybe in the game, you missed a shot or something, and do you have something that to tell yourself to forget it and keep moving forward? Yeah, I've actually adopted something from Ted Lasso that mm. me and my oh, teammates, yeah. that yeah. me and my teammates use this year. Uh, and it's the saying of be a goldfish. Mm. We would all tape our wrists and I would go and write mine and then I would write on some of theirs, mm -hmm. but we all pretty much had a goldfish on there. Nice. The goldfish thing was kind of just a symbol of like be a goldfish because mm -hmm. they have short-term memory. Right. So when you make a mistake, forget about it, move on. Mm -hmm. uh, because I've found if you don't do that, it takes you out of the present right. and it prevents you from, from performing at the way that you're capable of. Yeah. What's the most pressure you felt in a, in a game? Uh, I don't know. If, have you taken a couple PKs? Oh, uh, yeah. Okay, so, so <laughs> yeah. you could say uh, PK that was the most pressure you felt. And then how would you deal with this? So whether either game or PK? Well, being honest, my mm -hmm. first game as a freshman at SMU, I took a PK oh, as a, wow. and I missed it. It was okay. probably the wow. worst PK that I think <laughs> I've ever seen. That's hard for them to put you in that position. Like I've seen you in the World Cup when they put the youngest player to take the PK. Like, like you know, you have to have that experience. Yeah, it was, I guess, you know, my coach apologized to me after because it was like <laughs> I really didn't prepare you or right. let you know that could have been a possibility. Mm -hmm. But it's, yeah, it was the worst penalty I think I've ever <laughs> taken, ever seen. What, what, what happened? Where to go? <laughs> Not on the frame of the goal. It like <laughs> oh, yeah. went the corner flag it was mm, really oh, like i kicked the ground pretty oh, hard and okay. I, somehow the ball went off my shin <laughs> like it was actually really oh. bad but it was a great learning moment and then i didn't take penalties you know for sme for two years mm -hmm. and then i didn't start taking them until the last two years mm -hmm. and then uh, never missed one again mm, very nice i practiced them a lot so yeah. i was like very comfortable and confident mm -hmm. with them i guess the one where i felt the most pressure though would probably be this year this past year we were losing to cincinnati mm -hmm. We were sitting at sixth place uh, at the risk of not making our conference tournament. Mm -hmm. And we needed the point to tie them to, you know, still be in the running. Mm -hmm. And there's three minutes left. Yeah. Like, I started thinking to myself, like, oh, my gosh, like, I don't want to I don't want to let anybody down. Like, mm -hmm. this is I, I like I have to come through for my teammates. And then, then I was like, wait a second. No, I've got this. Right. I've been practicing this. Like, right. so I just stepped up, took it. But I could definitely if that was the first time I think I could really feel that pressure mm -hmm. uh, of Oh my gosh, taking a penalty right. <laughs> like it, it for the first time mm -hmm. since my freshman year, probably. Okay. Uh, how do you get to that point of being completely present in the moment in the, in the game? I do a lot of mindfulness work mm -hmm. before I compete. The professor I was talking about that worked for the Mavericks that I've had, uh, Professor DK. This one takeaway I had from his class was writing a statement of I am, mm -hmm. I can and I will. And that's become pretty routine for me to where it's meaningful for me. Mm -hmm. And so that's like how I start off my journaling session before going into every match. I used to be someone that would play with a lot of fear of failure or those types of things. And so I sit there and I write maybe some of my fears that I've had or I have. And then I 
write a little arrow and I shift the perspective mm -hmm. onto how I can, those are not fears, mm. right? So it's like, it's just my inner gremlin speaking to me mm. and I'm, I'm going to rewrite it and I'm going to create a new perspective that's going to help me and not hold me back. Mm. So dumping all that kind of gives this free space for my mind. Right. So when I show up to the game, I'm not thinking about any of that anymore. All the things I would have used to think about, oh, I need to do this, I need to mark this person, I need, mm -hmm. that's, that's all, I'm planning on all those things to be more instinctive for me. Because mm -hmm. at that point, and like when, when I'm starting to warm up and I'm on the bus ride to the game, all the details and everything I've studied. Mm -hmm. And so everything, I'm, I'm letting instinct take over mm -hmm. instead of my brain. Mm -hmm. That mindset worked out, uh, you're able to make it to pro, so now we can talk about the, 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 pro, the pro process. So. Before you talk about your team, can you talk about just recruiting and actually even getting in, in the room where you're talking to a pro team? Like, how was that? It's been a really fun, crazy <laughs> yeah. process. Yeah. yeah. No, I, I entered the draft in the NWSL. Yeah. I didn't end up getting drafted, mm -hmm. which obviously, you know, you look at the players that get drafted. There's so many good players mm -hmm. and not a lot of draft spots. Right. You know what I mean? Uh, so it was, it was really cool to see a lot of, like I said, Messiah Bright, Riley mm -hmm. Mattingly, seeing both of them drafted was honestly for me just as good as me getting drafted mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. like they're like family to me. Mm -hmm. There's several different paths for professional soccer, right. especially for women. Mm -hmm. It's on the rise. It's yeah, up and coming. Sure. Past 10 years has gotten a lot more, you know, promising mm -hmm. than where it was. Uh, people now when I say I'm playing professional soccer, you get this different response than I would have got when I was younger saying <laughs> I want to play professional soccer you get like really yeah. people like girls do that mm -hmm. so it's like it's really cool that it's the game has changed so much mm -hmm. and all the women that have put in the work to change the game mm -hmm. so you know my path is different right mm -hmm. so it's not NWSL I've been to a couple of different open tryouts in the NWSL mm -hmm. and uh pre in a preseason and stuff like that but I just didn't feel like that was the right path for me in my development mm -hmm. And so I've had a lot of great mentors say, you know, maybe the best route for you is to go overseas and maybe play in Champions League and mm -hmm. get some exposure mm -hmm. and try and come back. Just because things don't go the way maybe you, you picture doesn't mean it's done or it's mm -hmm. over. Like there's so many pathways. Mm -hmm. And honestly, I've told myself the whole time about pursuing professional soccer, I'll be grateful for any team that wants to give me any opportunity at all. Because right. I just want to play and mm -hmm. want to play at a high level and I want to continue developing as a player found a team a team's found me to mm -hmm. where they really prioritize development and uh, that's evident in their organization mm -hmm. they've produced some some players that come in mm -hmm. work with them for a year and then they go to somewhere else and mm -hmm. find their dream transfer mm -hmm. so it's it's really cool i think the process is really cool and rewarding it's mm -hmm. just you got it it's going to look different for everybody can you talk about the tryout process? How many teams did you try out for? And then what was that like? I tried out for two two different teams. Uh, I went to the open tryout of Houston and then Louisville. Mm -hmm. uh, it was really cool. I made some new friends. <laughs> yeah, so yeah. So it was cool to hear about other people's experiences. Mm -hmm. Hearing about some of the girls that have gone overseas because I'll be going overseas. Mm -hmm. So hearing about their stories and... And my favorite tip was bring your own peanut butter because <laughs> okay. they don't have that over there. Uh, and I'm yeah. like, yeah. So yeah. hearing those types of things are really fun, but then also training with that intensity mm -hmm. again and and learning about what some of those training sessions will look like for me in a couple months it was just a really cool experience mm -hmm. yeah it's just experience yeah. and exposure so right. it was fun yeah you, well you talked about all the positives but i thought it was like tell me about the the stressful parts of it where you're going in there you know like you have to perform because your coach is watching like what was the stressful part of it the stressful part i would say is being in a different training environment because mm -hmm. you're showing up and you're playing with girls that you've never played with before and you only got one or two days right. <laughs> to like kind of build some type of cohesion. But I guess, you know, that was probably the most stressful part for mm -hmm. me was, okay, how can I work well with these players? Mm -hmm. uh, and how, how can we, you know, make each other better? How can we uh, produce something that we're all mm -hmm. proud of? But I, I, like I said, it's when you go into those experiences, it's really just the best you can do. Mm -hmm. And so I wasn't really putting all this pressure on myself. You know, I just said to myself, you know, it's just opportunity for mm -hmm. exposure and experience. Mm -hmm. And it's great training mm -hmm. to to prepare for whatever I'll I'll have in my future. Mm -hmm. So really going into it, I just saw I have nothing to lose at this right. point. So yeah. why would I not do it? Well, you have a great mindset. But, okay. uh, <laughs> Thanks. but uh, talk about your team you've actually gone to. So I don't know if you haven't announced it, but we're going to speak it into existence. So breaking news. What's what's the team? <laughs> it's all the way in Greece. Cyprus is a separate island, okay. but yeah, it's beautiful. Mm -hmm. Yeah, how'd they find you? Or how they recruit you? I don't know if they found my highlight video. <laughs> I'm actually really not sure. <laughs> my agent has dealt with most of the, the dealings. I've only really spoken to their president through an introduction. Mm -hmm. The coolest thing to me, other than the location, because <laughs> it's just beautiful, yeah. like other than playing soccer, play, I've never played soccer at a place like that. Mm -hmm. Like it just yeah. sounds 
amazing, but it's super competitive. Mm -hmm. And I am someone that is like really, really competitive, hardworking. So hearing about their success and how they're striving for more mm -hmm. and and how their goal is to get girls in, develop them and help them, you know, elevate and find different places to go. It just mm -hmm. kind of spoke to me. They've made an, uh, an offer. And so I'm just kind of waiting mm -hmm. around to to hopefully I'll be signing with them soon. Okay. Hopefully. hopefully. Yeah. <laughs> you talked about your faith earlier. Uh, do you have a mantra or like everything happens for a reason? Like, uh, is it something that helps you get through the low moments and then even moments like these where you're making a big, huge decision, but you're kind of at peace with it? My uh, faith carries me through every single day mm -hmm. <laughs> and yeah. every single spurt of adversity I've ever had. Mm -hmm. I guess me being a perfectionist, <laughs> uh, something that I've really grown in my faith with is, you know, things out of my control don't worry about them because mm -hmm. someone else is taking care of them. Right. God's taking care of them mm -hmm. and take it day by day mm -hmm. because at the end of the day, like I can only worry about what I can control, mm -hmm. which is very little. Right. <laughs> exactly. So yeah. kind of just fully trusting mm -hmm. prayer is, mm -hmm. I feel like, you know, where I, one of my like sacred places, my happy places, but it's also just like, I feel like those opportunities come, those types mm -hmm. of opportunities come because, come because they're meant for you. Mm -hmm. right. And, and so, yeah, I definitely feel like, that's been a huge part mm -hmm. of okay. all of it. Yeah, you keep mentioning your perfectionist uh, attitude. So what do you do on your, your days off when you're trying to relax and not trying to think about uh, <laughs> what you should have done better in the last game? <laughs> what do you do when you're, you're trying to relax? Um, relaxing, yeah, I'm really bad at relaxing. Okay, <laughs> I'm really bad at relaxing. <laughs> yeah, okay. just being that's transparent. One area, that's one area you have to improve, relaxing. <laughs> yeah, because I've had every single coach I've ever played for tell me the worst thing for me is me being in charge of my own training. <laughs> Because I do too much. Uh, yeah. So uh, relaxing is definitely hard for me, but I've found other hobbies. Mm -hmm. I feel fulfilled doing those other mm -hmm. hobbies. So it's like a distraction because mm -hmm. I'm really bad at sitting and doing nothing. Yeah, right. I'm not, I can't really like sit around and like watch TV mm -hmm. or like watch a movie without like thinking I need to be doing something. Mm -hmm. So I found other hobbies. Uh, yeah, what are those? Poetry is one that's that I nice. discovered uh, while being at SMU. Mm -hmm. It's something that's like a little hidden gem yeah. of mine, okay. but it's something that I'm very passionate for. Mm -hmm. And it's something that I found outside of sport that I just love and adore. Right. Mm -hmm. um, starting jujitsu soon. Okay, okay, there we yeah. go. Yeah, and um, I'm now gonna learn different languages. Nice. So yeah, I've yeah, started okay. with Greek. Okay, you gotta start there. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and so I just kind of finding things that I do enjoy doing, that mm -hmm. challenging myself right. in different ways mm -hmm. other than soccer. Mm -hmm has really helped me mm -hmm. relax. Yeah. yeah, I don't think you need to watch TV or watch movies if that's something that doesn't fit you. But yeah, doing things like where you're challenging yourself, still bettering yourself, it's still relaxing. I think you can still do that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I have to. I had to find the right fit for me, <laughs> for sure. Because it's really, I wish I could just sit and like do nothing, but mm -hmm. I'm always feeling like I should be doing something mm -hmm. right. and doing something exceedingly well. <laughs> yeah. So it's just like I've had to, had to learn. All right, one more thing about uh, being a super senior and a senior, mm -hmm. how do you how do you lead your teams? And then going into this pro environment where, I mean, there probably might be other new players too, but where you're going to be one of the new players, how are you still going to lead in that sense too? Yeah, something about me, I guess, and my leadership skills, I would say are kind of unique. Mm -hmm. uh, because the central core of my leadership skills are relationships. Mm -hmm. I value my relationships mm -hmm. with my teammates more than anything. Mm -hmm. Being somebody that values relationships and cares so much about other people, I think it no matter what team I'm going to be on, I'm going to have an impact in that way because I really care about investing in my teammates, mm -hmm. helping them in whatever way that I can help them and learning from whatever ways I can learn from them. Right. Being a leader where relationships are the center of everything mm -hmm. uh, that, that I do and that I care about, it really, it helps me, you know, when it comes to joining teams mm -hmm. because like that's just, I, I want to get to know my right. teammates <laughs> yeah. and I want to learn about their lives, where they're from yeah. and their hobbies, their passions, mm -hmm. their goals. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. So when you get to this new team, you're going to make sure to put yourself out there and start talking to everybody? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe not at first. It takes time. Yeah, yeah, it takes time. Because <laughs> I'm very much like, I'm very authentic mm -hmm. about the way I carry myself. Mm -hmm. And and I want to make sure, you know, like I'm genuine and mm -hmm. everything. Something that I realized as a, a, a player, coach, one day, a uh, leader, mm -hmm. teammate, is, you know, every relationship that you're going to have is different. Mm -hmm. Every person you interact with, on a team or in a working environment, no matter where you are, yeah. every person is different. Yeah. So your relationship with them is going to be different. Mm -hmm. They have different needs, mm -hmm. different ways they need to be communicated to, with, mm -hmm. uh, and different things that get them motivated. Right. Well, you've given some great insights so far. And we're going to end with the final five questions. These are the final five questions okay. I like to ask all the athletes. So the first question is, what's the misconception about being a, I typically say D1 athlete, but you can say pro athlete. I don't know if, so misconception about being a D1 or 
pro or elite athlete. If you don't play, then you're not worth anything. Mm -hmm. okay. Or how much you get on a stat sheet determines your worth or whatever awards you get determines your worth. Uh, yeah, I think that's a big misconception for a lot of athletes within themselves. And mm -hmm. I think a lot of people that aren't in at, um, the shoes of a student athlete or an elite athlete mm -hmm. don't really, they look at the stats right. and the playing time, right. but they don't see the work and the dedication it takes for every single member of that team mm -hmm. to produce whatever's like the end product of that team. Mm -hmm. And so I think that that's a really common misconception. And I think it causes a lot of, you know, insecurity and, um, leaves a lot of people feeling mm. like they really just don't belong. Okay. But I, I still don't, I, that's like the number one misconception that I think. The second one is what's the worst conditioning workout of your career? Uh, great. Yeah, so. Oh my gosh. There was a spring where, uh, we have a very common test called the beep test. Mm -hmm. And it's like 22 yards at level 39, 60 times. And then like after we have shuttles oh. and back, back to back. Yes. Wow. And it was just like, it was, it was like my first spring ever. And I was like, <laughs> stars were coming mm -hmm. in and that's when you know like it's just i just remember that spring being like okay i'm in the best shape of my life i die every <laughs> right. tuesday but yeah she definitely pushed us really hard with fitness now we're talking about the pleasant stuff so what was the best memory of your career i played by in the middle midfield with a, a teammate of mine named katina sapos mm -hmm. it's her seventh year this year but my fifth year she's gone through you know a lot of injury and mm -hmm. a lot of adversity one of my reasons uh, that I came to SMU was also to play with a player like her mm. as, a, as a defensive mid. She just is really, really good. And she's somebody that not going to get all the accolades or the mm. credit, but deserves every right. thing there is to get because she is, she's like a tempo setter, heart of a team. Uh, and I just adore playing with her, but I missed playing with her. It would be times when we would play together, but she was never 100%. Mm -hmm. And I had to watch her go through, you know, ACL injury after ACL injury after mm. ACL injury. Mm. Uh, she's had like six, seven surgeries while being at SMU. Stepping on the field with her this year, uh, our first game and our last game, our senior night together, mm -hmm. was very special to me just to end with her. She's like a sister to me. So mm -hmm. playing, finishing together, seeing her step on the field again and be happy and, and she's pursuing a professional career right as on. well. So I, I really do think she's made, she's one of the reasons that has made my SMU experience so rewarding. And right. so she's a big part of it, seeing her, back and, yeah. and healthy and everything is just that was probably my my mo and her staying healthy for our season i've got to say it's probably one of my my top things it's a great answer right there <laughs> and then, yeah and then uh what advice could you give to a high school athlete that wants to be college and pro athlete just because one person tells you something doesn't mean like it's just one person mm -hmm. so don't like i was told i was too small too uh, not athletic enough not fast enough uh always find a way to take what people say and use it mm -hmm. Even if it, it might not, it might be hurtful at times mm -hmm. or it might, but it's not meant to be hurtful and it's mm -hmm. never personal. Right. Whatever feedback you're getting, it's never personal mm -hmm. against you. You just have to change the perspective. Mm -hmm. Whatever feedback you get, no matter how negative or positive you view it, you can always use it to make you better. Mm -hmm. And so that's the one thing I would say is don't let one, one person's thing that they say to you define you. Instead, let it develop you mm -hmm. and let it build you and, and to become you're the best possible version of yourself. That was a great answer too. All right, so last one, last one here. How do you define the word winner? So not society's definition, but after a game, whether you won or lost on the, on the score sheet, how do you tell yourself that you were a winner? Defining winning in life to me is being the best possible version of myself I can be every single day. And I find that that carries over into the sport. And that's like kind of knowing yourself. Um, so that's how, kind of how I would define winning and knowing yourself as a player. How did I perform? It's not always about did I score? Did I get an assist? Did I, it's how did I perform? How did it help the team? How did it impact the team? How did I get better? So the way I'm looking at, at winning is getting better. Mm -hmm. The same overarching thing applies to a team. But I think, you know, when you have everybody that's striving to win and be the best versions of themselves, you're going to get those results. Mm -hmm.